Well, good evening. I'm Richard Haas, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the Council on Foreign Relations. And tonight is the latest in our What to Do About series. The subject is What to Do About Russia. And this is a series that is focused on essentially a foreign policy challenge. And we look at it in some ways uh, akin to how the National Security Council would, would look at it, where we begin with analysis and we end up uh, with prescription. We'll do some of the work up here, and then we will open it up to uh, you all. This is uh, all made possible by uh, HBO, for which we uh, are eternally uh, grateful. We've got you all in the room, our members here. We've also got members around the uh, country and the world, thanks to the wonders of modern uh, technology. It's about 6 o'clock here in the east uh, now. We will finish up at 7.15. Uh, Let me just very quickly uh, introduce uh, the three people who are going to help us navigate uh, this, this really important and timely and complex uh, subject. When I used to teach at the Kennedy School, I used to sometimes remind my students that foreign policy can be hard. This is a case study in foreign policy being hard, but also, uh, also important. My immediate uh, left here is uh, Heidi Krabbel Redeker. Heidi uh, has all sorts of hats. Most important, she's a senior fellow here at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. She's also CEO, and I will do my best to get it right, of International Capital Strategies. And prior to this, she was the first person to hold the position of chief economist, chief economist at the Department of State. And she also has a background on Capitol Hill. So she is one of these, uh, I think, a really wonderful example of what we have in America, the in and outer. <laughs> and uh, I think it's one of the things that uh, makes the American system special, is that you can do that. To her left is another person of uh, also an in and outer, Evo Dalder. Evo now uh, heads up the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. He's been in that job for about two, two and a half years. And prior to that, Evo represented the United States at NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, for more than four years. He also served on the staff of the uh, National uh, Security Council. He's a widely pu published uh, author, and even I used to work together at the Brookings Institution when we were both young. Uh, third and far from least is Professor Kimberly Martin. Kimberly is the Ann Whitney Olin Professor of Political Science at Barnard, and she's also a faculty member of both the uh, Graduate School of Arts and Sciences and the uh, and SIPA, the School of International Public Affairs at Columbia, and there she uh, directs the program on U.S.-Russian relations at the Harriman Institute, and she's written more books than most of us have read. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, what we're going to do is uh, begin with a conversation amongst the uh, four of us, then we'll open it up. Uh, the timing is good, just as I was you know, preparing for this and reading some, some of the latest. Uh, you know, if you look at the price of oil and you look at it denominated in uh, ruble terms, it's basically at something of a five or six year low. Uh, we have lots going on in Europe and the Middle East geopolitically, so I don't think we will uh, we will lack for, for things to talk about. Uh, Professor Martin, Kimberly, why don't we start with you for a second, okay. just to uh, say some things about, before we get into the, the, the particulars of the policy uh, debate we've got to grapple with, how do you see Russia right now? How should we see uh, this country of uh, 140, 145 million people with a shrinking economy? Well, what should we make of it? What should we take of it? Thank you, Richard. Well, I think that we have to keep in mind that there are really two Russias. <laughs> There is the Russia that feels humiliation and betrayal. Um, it feels that the West did it wrong because of the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, what has happened over the last 25 years. And uh, there's no question that President Putin plays on that feeling of that part of Russia, and that helps explain his popularity as his militarism continues. And then on the other hand, we have the Russia that is truly the Russia of great power status where we have phenomenal contributions to the arts and culture and technology and science by brilliant people um, and increasingly really good business people 
And those are people who don't want to be isolated from the West. They want to be uh, a partner with the West. They want to have the West pay attention to them, um, but they, not, not for the same kind of militaristic reasons that the, the Putin faction has in mind. And they have been decreasing uh, in their ability to express their views publicly, but we have to remember that they're there. And so the challenge that the United States faces is that we have to be able to defend our interests and defend our allies and deter all kinds of militaristic actions that come from that one part of Russia while keeping our hand welcoming to the partner Russia that is going to be there long after Putin is gone. And so working that kind of dilemma is what the United States has to do. So to say that that part of Russia will be there long after Mr. Putin is gone begs two questions. One is, while he is here, yes. to what, ex what is the dominant of your two Russias? Yes. And second of all, just what date are you assuming Mr. Putin, <laughs> Mr. Putin is gone? Well, I'll answer the second one first. Mr. Putin is mortal, and so eventually he will be gone. He will not live eternally, uh, even if he manages to stay in power for another full term as president, which a, a number of people think is a very likely outcome. So we may be stuck with him for a while. Um, but uh, meanwhile, uh, his particular view of the outside world is no question the dominant one. He keeps it dominant by his control of the mainstream media. Um, he doesn't control media quite the way that China does at this point. If somebody wants to look, they can find other perspectives in Russian language media, but people don't tend to look. So mainstream television, the mainstream internet gives Putin's point of view on the world. Um, and he also has the ability to control things because he controls the former KGB, now the FSB. And those people can destroy anybody they want to destroy. They can destroy a career. They can destroy a life. And everybody knows that. And that means that even if there are people who are, are eager for there to be change in Russia because they believe that Russia is not following Russian national interests under Putin's leadership, they recognize that there's not much that they can do about it. And there's this feeling of hopelessness. And so one of the things that we have to do as the United States um, is try to figure out how can we give a sense of hope to people who are looking within Russia at what's happening um, and saying things are going in a direction that they don't like. I want to hold off a bit before I get to what we should try to do or not do. So Heidi, let me turn to you for a second just to give the economic take. Uh, the numbers are quite stark in terms of the, sh the shrinkage of the economy. Uh, it's still a heavily concentrated, what we used to call a cash crop economy, the cash crop being oil and gas. Uh, why don't, so why don't you give us your take on, on, on the reality? How bad is it? So I think, I, I think the Russian economy is, is in trouble. And you know, one of the reasons that it is in trouble, um, and, and I have a, a long-term pessimistic view, is that you, have, you had the grinding down of, of growth before you had uh, a drop in commodity prices and the sanctions layered in. So you already had a, 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 a pretty steep decline there's an over-reliance, uh, as Richard mentioned, on, um, on, on commodities. So oil and gas, about 50% of the budget, two-thirds of exports, um, very, very you know, highly reliant on, on, uh, on commodities, whereas for years, and this is really for years, it's been an ambition to try and diversify the economy. And I think there have been stages um, in, uh, in Russia's development where we've seen some diversification. But, but right now, we have a, a, an outlook where Poverty levels are rising, particularly you know outside of Russia and St. Petersburg. So if you, it's a very big country. So outside of Moscow, I mean, sorry, outside of um, of Moscow and St. Petersburg. So I, I spent a lot of time working in the Russian Far East and living there, and so my perspective is often more from uh, from outside of of, uh, of the big cities, and poverty rates are going up, standard of living is going down, um, incomes are going down, inflation was coming down, but on the back of the sanctions on Turkey, you're probably going to see it come up again. And so those are sort of the, the immediate issues. Long-term demographic issues are, are going to start to kick in. You have uh, some, some big challenges, I think, um, and where the, the biggest, my biggest fear is that they have an immensely talented population, and they're moving out. So in a, in a global economy where, uh, in a very competitive global economy where you need talent and you need innovators and you need expertise and you need high tech, they are all you know, moving out right now. And so the numbers that I've seen, about 200,000 this past year, 
uh, of, uh, of really, you know, I think some of the elite of Russia that are coming, you know, to Silicon Valley and Cambridge and London, other places. And that's going to be, that's going to end up taking a, a, a big hit down the road. So there are a lot of things that if you layer in, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic. And if you read Richard's book on foreign policy begins at home. It's the Russian <laughs> translation is foreign policy begins at home ski. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's yeah. going to have an impact on foreign policy eventually. Uh, what is the price of oil that the Russians in, plug into their budget calculations that they think they, they need? Like, and more broadly, the, I, the International Energy Agency just came out with a long-term assessment. Many others have concluded that essentially low oil prices are here to stay for so the foreseeable future and then some for lots of structural reasons from reduced demand and far greater supply because of new technologies and uh, the like. Where are the Russians in terms of their assumptions now? So the, the, new, the, the most recent budget that just went through the Duma, I think, last night was uh, the budgets uh, at $50 a barrel. Um, so they're, they're anticipating a much, a much lower price. And the challenge, and I think even the, the central bank governor uh, has, been, has been vocal about the fact that they need a new growth model that reflects a new reality in oil prices. And, but in the meantime, with the poverty, with the shrinkage of the economy, I guess people are voting with their feet. Uh, but to the extent people vote other ways and we see polls, so far at least Mr. Putin's popularity seems fairly robust, if not stratosphere. So I also, I also think that Russians are very resilient. Uh, I think that over time there, there, will be, there will be some price to pay because one of the, one of the bargains was I will give you growth and a better standard of living, mm -hmm. uh, but there, there are rollbacks and there are, prices, there are prices to pay. I don't think that the prices to pay have really been that big of, a, you know, of an issue for a lot of Russians. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think when you start having hits to pensions, when investment that doesn't get made starts to, starts to really show, uh, and living standards really start to decrease, that you're, you're going to see some reaction. Before we turn to Evo and the threat that Russia poses, I was going to have one last question of Professor Martin then. To what extent does Mr. Putin specifically turn, do you believe, and Eva, I'd like to hear you on this as well, to foreign policy as a, a valve, as something of a way to <laughs> compensate for the lack of economic return and political openness, this is a way to uh, satisfy, shall we say, national longings. I think you're right. And there's no question that his populism gets expressed through this militaristic foreign policy of showing the United States that they're not going to take it anymore. And the best sign of that was uh, his complete ignoring of the truckers' protests that has been uh, galvanizing uh, that community in Russia over the past several weeks. They managed to shut down the, the Moscow Ring Road uh, for several hours uh, uh, one day uh, last week. Week, and yet it didn't, uh, again, get expressed in the, in the mainstream press, even though if you read some of the, the other Russian language press, you could learn about it. If enough of that uh, sense of unhappiness by ordinary people in outlying areas becomes strong enough and the FSB can't control it, that is one thing that could lead to a turnover in the top uh, leaders. But before that, but to what extent do we think that, and it's probably it's a natural segue to Eva then, that what he has done over the last, what, year, 18 months in Ukraine, Crimea, what he's more recently been doing in the Middle East. To what, to what extent do we think a more assertive Russian foreign policy is motivated by a kind of let's distract attention away from the home front? Well, I think clearly that is a, if not the motivating factor. Uh, I mean, I would describe Russia as a declining power for all the reasons that we, we, we have heard here. Uh, for 25 years, the bargain was uh, uh, internally to, the bargain was, as, as Heidi said, to provide for the economic growth in the society. It hasn't come. The modernization that was necessary hasn't been, uh, hasn't been instituted. And as oil prices fell and sanctions have now been imposed, uh, the, the economic consequences of the, of the 25 years of mismanagement of the economy, of a reliant, an over-reliance on oil and gas, where, as you rightly said, the prices are not only down, but they're going to stay down for quite a while, uh, leads you to uh, wonder where you're going to get your political power uh, from, and it's going to come from nationalism. It's a traditional way in which declining powers act, uh, and there's no surprise that, uh, uh, that uh, he's acting in this way. Um, uh, whether it will work is, of course, the big issue, uh, but clearly Ukraine had very little to do with either Ukraine or the West or anything else. It had everything to do with what was happening in Moscow and a decline, uh, the declining power and 
a need by uh, the president of Russia to uh, find a valve for the unhappiness of its population, uh, and nationalism became the way to do that. And given that, and more broadly, given the capability of uh, Russian forces, given what we've seen in uh, Ukraine, to what extent should we see Russia as a threat either because of its objective capability or because of what we've also seen as demonstrations of a greater willingness to use whatever capabilities they have? I think the Russian military has, for the last 10 years, invested quite a bit in modernizing its capabilities. So it, is, it has a more capable military than it did 10 years ago. So but it's not, it's very different than, say, from the, what we, the kind of obituaries written about Afghanistan and the Russian military. This exactly. is a fundamentally... It, well, no, so it, it, is a, it is a more capable, more modernized military, but it's a very modest military by standards, certainly of the United States, uh, or even the standards of the West in general. Uh, it has certain capabilities. We are seeing that displayed in certain ways, uh, particularly in Syria, a little less so in uh, in Ukraine, in part because it's hidden, um, but it is it is a capability that will you, know, you can deploy aircraft into Syria and bomb uh, certain targets. Can you actually fight a war against a well uh, a a well armed adversary like the United States? That is a question that is still out there. The difference is he's willing to use force. He's demonstrated he's willing to use force. He is seemingly not deterred by anything that other people might be uh, willing and capable of doing. And as a result, he is dominating, at least in the short run, uh, the battlefield. Uh, is, but is he at all deterred, or might he be deterred, by the economic or human costs of using force? Is that something that could come back, if you will, to haunt him so somewhat we, politically at home? I think we've had a debate uh, among uh, the Russian experts to the extent to which casualties, in particular, because we know the casualties are very important, uh, when it came to Afghanistan, the extent to which casualties in particular would, uh, would be a deterrent effect on, on him. Uh, one of the reasons why he was hiding the Russian uh, presence in, in Ukraine and has denied that there was a, or continues to deny the Russian presence in Ukraine uh, was by the belief that casualties is something that he can't sustain. In Syria, he has sustained casualties uh, and he has done so openly, uh, not only when the Turks, uh, the Turks uh, shot down the airplane, but before. Uh, they had a number of casualties, and they were recognized as casualties in a way that uh, soldiers and, and infantrymen who, were, who died in Ukraine were not uh, recognized. They were buried in the middle of the night uh, uh, without any recognition that they had suffered uh, fatalities in, in this conflict. Yeah, so that, that, that points, at least to some extent, that there is a limit to the degree to which you can use this, this valve of uh, mm -hmm. foreign expansion of foreign military uh, uh, adventurism as a means to detract, uh, atten distract attention from, from your local problems. I want to turn to the two principal arenas of Russian activism, uh, one being uh, Ukraine, the other being the Middle East. And then I want to turn, and after we discuss that for a minute, I want to talk about the tools that we've used or might use. In terms of Ukraine, if I had to sort of encapsulate what seems to be the conventional wisdom these days, is that Crime, Russians have zero intention of changing anything with Crimea, but they slightly dial down the temperature in eastern Ukraine. Is that a, a fair description, or is that missing? Uh, is that missing? Is that missing things? They're, they're, they've been dialing it back up uh, in the last few weeks, and so I think it's an open question what Putin intends to do. Putin loves pulling surprises. Um, and it was very interesting that he didn't mention Ukraine and he didn't mention Crimea in a major speech that he gave on the State of the Nation last week. And there have been Russian analysts who have said, oh, it's because he's losing in Ukraine. And there have been other Russian analysts inside Russia who have said, no, it's because he's accomplished what he wanted to in Ukraine, so he has nothing left to say. I think the truth is he's probably planning some sort of a surprise in Ukraine, and we just have to wait and see what it is. And the surprise could be negotiation and some form of uh, negotiated settlement uh, in order to get the sanctions lifted and to get Western attention back in a positive direction in Russia. Or it could be the intention to ramp things up and really make but, Ukraine suffer. But, uh putting on my national security advisor hat, that's not very helpful. I know it's so not. So I want to know, <laughs> what are you betting on? Are you betting that he has basically decided he doesn't want to dial up in Ukraine because right now he's got what he wants there or he's more concerned with the Middle East, that essentially he's, his attention is, has, has pivoted? 
or I mean, at some point, we've got to make a bet about what he, uh, what, what, what we're seeing and what we're likely to see. So, what is your bet? My bet for the last year and a half hasn't really changed, which is that he will continue to have low-level conflict in eastern Ukraine without expanding it very much. Um, he has a very strong incentive to try to keep Ukraine weak, to try to make it seem as though the Ukrainian government has failed, to try to keep uh, the the fact of there being rebels in eastern Ukraine something that is still on people's agenda. Um, but as Evo said, what the the evidence indicates is that he really doesn't have the strength right now to try to fight two major wars simultaneously. Um, and at the moment, um, you know, Western attention on Ukraine is, is sort of uh, at, at a low point. He's told people in this, in this uh, speech that he gave last week that we should expect sanctions to endure for the foreseeable future. So nobody is thinking that sanctions policy is going to change. Um, but keeping things sort of unstable but not really dangerous is something that probably serves his interest. So if I had to place a bet, that's what I'd bet. Do you agree with that, Eva? Yeah, I, I, I think his number one priority is to maintain uh, the, the initiative uh, and in order, to, in order to make sure that the domestic situation remains one where people will support him. Uh, his number two priority is to make sure that Ukraine does not succeed as a Western yeah. state. Uh, that's why he went into Ukraine. He couldn't allow it to, to succeed. And he will dial up the tension on Ukraine if he believes that the reform uh, and, uh, that has taken place in Ukraine actually starts to succeed. So I, I think that's what I would look for, um, to see whether or not that is the succeeding. And number three, I think he is trying to find a way to get underneath, to, to get out of sanctions. Uh, and the, the Middle East move is, is fundamentally a trying to make the case not only to maintain his presence in, in Syria, which is important in the long term, uh, but making the case that the West needs him, and therefore, why don't you, why don't you give up on sanctions uh, with regard to Ukraine so that, uh, so that we can move forward? I just want to push it before, uh, push it, Heidi, on the sanctions, which is, uh, is it too soon, or is it, do we have enough transparency to have a sense about what the impact of these sanctions have been on Russia, how significant they are? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a huge debate out there as to whether or not the san sanctions are actually effective or not. My, you know, my, my first reaction is if they were so ineffective, why would Putin jump to use them in Turkey? Um, but the, uh, the, the, the reality is we didn't use very, we didn't escalate the sanctions tool very much. Um, and there has been an impact, particularly in the ability to access markets and for companies and banks to refinance. So I think, you know, the, what, what we did see is uh, very minimal escalation in terms of the very scalpel-like tr uh, you know, Treasury and State Department-led uh, sanctions policy that was put in place, and I think it was very, it was very thoughtful. Um, it, was done, it was done extremely reluctantly. It was done together with European partners in lockstep, and that was a diplomatic feat in and of itself. Um, but in terms of whether they've been effective, I would say you know, the, the central bank has plowed through a, a, a significant amount of reserves um, trying to assist Russian banks and companies to help refinance um, and recapitalize them um, on the back of a number of different things. But they still have a couple hundred billion dollars worth of reserves sure. left. Sure, um, but they've gone from, they've gone uh, from about, from 400 plus, uh, for 500 plus about two years ago to about 366 right now. So it's, a bit, they've, they've run through, they still have a, it's a pretty robust you know, amount to, to be working with. Uh, and I think the team at the Central Bank of Russia is actually a very talented team. But I think they, they, are, they would be the first to say that there have been challenges because of the sanctions that are in place. I also don't think that the sanctions are going to be rolled off on the back of any grand deal um, on, on Syria, certainly not in the next six months. I want I to come back to that in a minute because we have a question, not so much predictive, but prescriptive, whether under any situation, whether we should be willing to do that. But I want to come to that in a minute. Kimberly, you want you been yeah, interested? Just a, a couple of thoughts on sanctions. The sanctions that Putin has put in place have been on goods. We have not put sanctions against Russia on goods. The reason that that matters is that we know from the experience of Saddam Hussein and other dictators that it's often in the interests of authoritarian leaders to put sanctions on goods that are being imported because it allows their inner network to engage in smuggling that is against the law and it actually gives another economic boost to their inner network. Mm -hmm. The second thing to keep in mind uh, about the sanctions is that they give Putin an excuse 
for what the economy looks like right now, the evidence indicates that the biggest impact on the Russian economy has come from the collapse of oil prices, which is completely unrelated to the sanctions. But he can point to the sanctions and say, see, look at how terribly the West is treating you. It's the West's fault that the economy is in the current state that it's in, and so we have to be strong against the terrible West that is once again betraying us. Okay, so let's, I think it's, let's uh, just, just one, one last point on, on sanctions, as a signal, um, as well as a, you know, how, how we have affected behavior, I think both of those are, are very important to, to keep in mind when you're thinking, why do we actually put these sanctions in place? We responded to, um, to, to military with economic tools, and those tools have been effective and they were limited, but how were they, how were they effective? It wasn't just hitting various parts of the immediate circle of friends and family, um, of President Putin. It was financial institutions. It was also behavior, I believe, in, in Ukraine in terms of, of, of where the line was, was drawn in terms of whether or not there were going to be further military moves. Okay, so let's just look at Ukraine for a few minutes in isolation. Then I want to put, look at it in the larger context of what's, what also is, is going on and look at more broadly in Europe. Uh, so the, the questions are still, is what's going on in Ukraine something we can live with at this level of boil? Should we be doing more to help Ukraine economically or militarily? What other things why, might we be doing in Europe uh, in terms of uh, NATO? Or I mean, essentially, to what extent ought we to stay the course with where we are in, at the whole Ukraine-Russia standoff? Or to what extent ought we be introducing new elements to our policy now? Eva, why don't we start with you? Well, I think uh, we have two fundamental goals, it seems to me. Uh, three. First, most importantly, Russia cannot succeed. Uh, it has... The definition of success being? Be, so it cannot, the status quo is, is success on Russia's part. It has fundamentally violated a core tenet of the European security order, which is you don't change borders by force. It hasn't been done since 1945. It was central to the bargain in 1975 on the Helsinki Final Act. It was central to the recognition of the end of the Cold War and the Paris Charter. Uh, that uh, led to the creation of the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, and it was central to the denuclearization of Ukraine in the 1994 Budapest Memorandum signed by the United States, Great Britain, Russia, and Ukraine. In return for giving up its nuclear weapons, the United States, Britain, and uh, Russia recognized the borders of Ukraine as it was. Those have been violated. Uh, so, number one, we need to come to a situation where that violation is in one way or another reversed, preferably through a diplomatic process. Number two, uh, this is a fight about the soul of Ukraine. And uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of the Ukrainian people have demonstrated that if they have a choice, they would like to reform their country and become part of the large Western club uh, of which all their neighbors have become a part. Uh, certainly the neighbors uh, to their west. And number three... Just so I understand it, are you... So, I, I, so the, the, the economic and political success of Ukraine, its fundamental transformation, is a, is a key interest for the United States. But does that mean that either EU membership or NATO membership... It doesn't, ought to so be, I, will, I will leave the issue of EU or NATO membership for the Ukrainians to decide. To decide? That's not their uh, decision? Uh, to... to to decide whether they want to seek it. It is then for NATO and the European Union to decide whether they will enter them. Uh, I don't think it is necessarily about NATO or EU membership. It is necessarily about Ukraine deciding uh, that it reforms its economic and political system to enable it to become like, say, Poland. Uh, I think NATO membership and EU membership facilitates that, and did, as it did with Poland. But that's a decision not for today, but for, for down the road. What about the arming Ukraine in the short run? What, 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 what's your, and we, this is something the administration has kicked around for several years. I am, you know, I'm on the record and I've uh, been for a long time that I think uh, that the provision of defensive lethal equipment to Ukraine is important. Uh, I believe this is a country that has been attacked. Uh, it doesn't have a, a NATO guarantee. It's not a member of NATO. It does have an Article 51 uh, of the UN Charter. Uh, right for not only individual but collective self-defense. And as a country that has been attacked, it should have the arms to defend itself. And particularly if we in the United States or NATO countries are not willing to defend Ukraine, a decision with which I 
uh, uh, don't have a problem, uh, preventing them, imposing in, in, in de facto an arms embargo uh, on Ukraine when they were want to define, uh, buy the weapons in order to defend themselves, I think is the wrong policy. Uh, Professor Martin, if we were to provide what we would describe as uh, defensive arms to Ukraine, what do you think the Russian reaction would be? Well, I'm on the record as opposing sending lethal military assistance to Ukraine, even though I very strongly support the institutional uh, assistance that we're giving in reforming the Ukrainian military, uh, especially because when I was there in May, uh, I heard from a lot of people who are involved in the fighting that the real problem that Ukraine faces is an absence of good quality command and control that's coming from the military officers at the top of the Ukrainian military. And what they all said is that it's not about the technology of command and control. Uh, it's about the psychology of the commanders. Uh, it's about the ability to communicate uh, and to have an understanding of what's actually going on in the field. Um, I'm also against the sending of uh, lethal weapons to Ukraine because Ukraine is already awash in weapons and Ukraine is also awash in militias that are not really under government control. And if at some point, we've already saw this a little bit in September, but if at some point the reformists really managed to get traction in Ukraine and to move the country in a new direction, some of those militias are associated with uh, large enterprises in Ukraine um, that have a very strong interest in not having uh, the Ukrainian economy become transparent. And they have a very strong interest in using those weapons against the government in Kyiv. Um, in terms of what Russia would do, I think, you know, in a sense, uh, the argument that, that we've heard a lot is that it doesn't really matter what we do, Russia will do what it wants to do anyway. I think there is a problem with the U.S. publicly supplying weapons to Ukraine, which is that if the U.S. publicly supplies lethal assistance to the Ukrainian forces, uh, what Putin will say is, see, what I've been telling you all along was correct. This really isn't about a Ukrainian civil war. This is really about the United States trying to encroach on Russian borders. And at that point, his major problem with casualties disappears. At this point, Evo and, and others are absolutely right that, that there is this very strong sense that uh, Russian boys shouldn't be sent to die in Ukraine, and so it's being kept private. But if Putin can make a case that what's actually happening is that the U.S. is threatening Russian borders by trying to have Ukraine be a launching point for attack on Russia, his casualties problems disappear, and at that point he can be very public and say, yes, I couldn't tell you before, but our boys have been fighting and dying all along, um, and it's time to mobilize ourselves against the United States, which is now trying to destroy Russia. Can I just do a follow-up on that, because mm -hmm. it's glad to have this opportunity. If Putin were to be faced with such a situation, uh, are there any constraints on his decision making? In the old days, say during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's been endless studies that the, the Soviet leadership at the time was actually quite institutionally constrained mm -hmm. with the Politburo and so forth and others. The question has arisen now whether the degree of personal leadership of Mr. Putin is such that he is actually under fewer institutional constraints than his predecessors were in the, in the old Soviet system. What is your take on that? I think that's absolutely true, although the more that we are delving into Soviet history, the more we get an understanding that the institutions were really always kind of a little bit of a sham. They had some impact on things, but in fact, the personal network connections always explained a lot of what was happening throughout the Soviet period, starting with the Stalin era, um, and uh, certainly uh, continuing into the Khrushchev era and, and beyond as well. Um, but you're right that there are fewer uh, institutional constraints. One thing that's very disturbing is that Putin has put a lot of his old friends from the KGB and the FSB into leadership positions, into a reconsolidated uh, defense industrial sector in Russia, which means that they have a very strong interest in Putin producing more and more weapons. When we hear about the S-300 going to Iran, the S-400 that's going to be deployed in Syria, uh, the Buk missile that shot down that plane, uh, the Malaysian plane over eastern Ukraine, keep in mind that all of those weapons are manufactured by the Almaz Ante Corporation, which has a lot of Putin's close friends at the top. And that means that every time a contract is signed, they can take their little bit or sometimes more than a little bit off the top of that contract. So there certainly are constraints. I mean, the Russian budget is not limitless. We've seen with the truckers' uh, uh, protests that at some point popular uh, unhappiness might rise up against spending too much on, on, uh, on, on defense uh, industry. Um, and I also think we have to keep in mind that Ukraine and, and Russia have always had a relationship that doesn't really make them different countries uh, to some extent. And so that if you start saying that uh, Russians are supposed to be killing Ukrainians 
that, that creates a, a psychological problem for Russia, and that would be a constraint on him. But the institutional constraint is not what it was. How do you want to weigh in on an Evo? And then I so I, I, would, I would very much agree with the, the case that it, it is absolutely um, the creation of a success story in, in Ukraine so that it, 10 years from now is, is a Poland. Um, and a great deal of that comes down to their ability to reform their economy. And a great deal of the reform of the economy comes down to the Ukrainians. So we're talking a lot about Russia, we're talking about a lot of different parties, but right now there's actually, you know, as we speak, a, a, a battle going on so that the next tranche of their IMF program can, can, uh, right. can come through. And the potential for, uh, you know, a, a, a political reshuffle right now on, on the back of questions around this economic reform. Corruption is really hard to tackle in Ukraine. There is, you know, it is, it is from top to bottom one of the more corrupt places um, on, the, on the planet. It has been challenged with corruption and rule of law for a very long time. And so there are so many different interests that, that stand to, to, to lose. Um, however, that is one of, the, one of the things that the protests at the Maidan were actually um, going after in the first place. So the population in, in Ukraine has actually paid a pretty significant price based on the reforms that Ukraine's already done, but what they're not seeing is the price to be paid um, on, for, for many of the elites that have, have been corrupt, and that's something that puts their IMF program and then every other bit of funding that is, that's linked to their IMF program at, at risk right now, and that's actually one of the reasons the vice president is there with a we stand by you, but here's a tough love message. You really need to do what, it, what you have to do um, to, to sure. get your own economy right. We can't, we'll be there for you, but we can't do it for you. Got it. You want to say something on this? Yeah, so I agree with that. Uh, and, and the success of Ukraine is about the economic change and reform and the end of corruption and the, and the political process that needs to happen. And that's the battle, because that's what Russia wants to prevent. And that's why, in fact, providing defensive capabilities to Ukraine is important. It is important to the success of Ukraine being able to make the change in order, in, in, it needs to do economically, in order to raise the cost to Russia of putting on the pressure and um, undermining the capacity of the Ukrainian system to say. So the two, the two are, in fact, linked. The capacity of Ukraine to defend itself as Russia tries to escalate, uh, as that goes up, your capacity to reform and, and continue the, the process of political and economic reform is more likely to succeed. Let me spend the last few minutes before we open it up on, on Syria. Uh, Russia has now uh, clearly invested fairly heavily on uh, strengthening the, uh, the, the current regime of Bashar al-Assad. I guess the question is whether that is a, uh, an independent or a dependent variable. Uh, and it would seem to me it's obviously in our interest to make it something that uh, we can change with time. So the, the issue is, what, if anything, can we put on the table to get Russia to do, both to do certain things, to make sure that the bulk of its targeting is on ISIS rather than other groups, and to think about supporting a political transition in Damascus, uh, and maybe even offering a Dasha to uh, Mr. al-Assad outside of, uh, of Moscow, are there things I mean, you're, that you believe we could, we could potentially offer to the Russians that would make them feel that their, their core interests, however they define them, would be protected under a scenario under which Mr. Assad would not be uh, in power uh, much longer? Is, there, is, that, is that in the realm of the, uh, the achievable? Because it's obviously in our interest that there, that, that, that were their case. So my view is on uh, that if you think Ukraine is hard, Try this one, right? <laughs> in part because it seems to me uh, Russia, the, the Russian action is both a dependent and an independent variable. The independent variable is the fact that Russia wants to maintain a, a military foothold in this region. It has had a military foothold. We forget that, but it's true. They've had a naval base in Syria for a long time, but they now have a physical military foothold in Syria. Uh, that they want to maintain no matter who is the president of Syria, and in that, in, in, in some ways, if that can be guaranteed, the fate of, of Assad becomes uh, less central to what they're trying to achieve. Uh, it is a dependent variable in the sense that uh, if you can demonstrate to the West, to the United States in particular, that you are an ally in the fight against ISIS, uh, 
you may be able to, uh, and, and not only the United States, the French uh, and, and the Germans, uh, you may be able to change the equation in Europe. Uh, and I think he's tried to do both at the same time. So what is our, our counter punch? Um, uh, the reason we need to get rid of Assad at some point is because Assad is fueling the very Sunni extremism that is fueling ISIS. And that how you're going to get a, a moderate Sunni governing structure in Syria, which is what is necessary in order to fight ISIS, how you do that with Assad in power is something we haven't I'm quite I'm actually not sure I agree with that. I think actually, I think that's a bridge too far. One could also think about an alternative governing structure that was still Alawite dominated, but not Mr. Assad dominated. And, and, and that may, so you may be able to get to that point. Uh, are we able to play these games with Russia playing its presence as both an independent and a dependent variable? That's, but, uh, that's the big question. But, you would, but it seems to me, I guess the question would be, why not try? Why would we not I, have a conversation? I think in some ways we are trying. I mean, I think that's, what's, that's what we're doing in Vienna. It's what we're going to do in New York in a couple of weeks or in a week. And why not then give uh, Mr. Putin standing in the Middle East? Why not basically make it clear we're not against them keeping their naval uh, access? Why not conceive it? I mean, I'm just putting it on the table, not saying advocating. Are there any circumstances under which we would change any of our policy in Ukraine in order to get what we want against ISIS? I mean, at some point, foreign policy is about priorities. Are there any circumstances under which we need to think that way? So that's a linkage I would not make on the Ukrainian side, in part because the Ukrainian fight is a, is a fight about fundamental order yeah. uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a, a near existential way. It's about how do we construct the order in Europe. Uh, so I wouldn't trade that for Russia. The question of what you would trade for Russia with regard to Assad, with regard to uh, a military presence of Russia in the region, which it already had, so just maintaining that, uh, I think are all issues that should be on the table in one form or another as you think through what your political strategy is uh, to just, get to. Just as a package, would you ever be open to thinking about the idea that we would not necessarily be against some of what Russia is doing in the Middle East? We would provide defensive weaponry to Ukraine and we would reduce sanctions. Is that a Redu package you reduce can sanctions? Yeah. Is that a package you can contemplate? Well, I think sanctions are linked to a political process, which is the solution of the Ukrainian problem minus Crimea. There are separate oh. sanctions for Crimea. Right. And if we can have that political process implemented, uh, the Minsk agreement, uh, in full, then uh, I think we are all agreed that sanctions can be lifted. But it's that political process that determines that, not what happens in Syria. So you don't want to have linkage in that sense? I don't want to have linkage in that, in that particular sense. Kimberly? Yeah, the, there's an organization called the Institute for the Study of War based in Washington that keeps track of where all the airstrikes have been happening in Syria over the weeks. And the last weekly report that they had that came out a few days ago indicated that absolutely nothing has really changed in Russia's approach to airstrikes in Syria. It wasn't enough that the airplane in Egypt uh, was bombed out of the skies, apparently, by the Islamic State. Um, what we see instead is that Russia is concentrating its airstrikes against the rebel groups that are fundamentally the most challenging to Assad, um, either in the, the southwestern part of Syria, uh, where they are uh, targeting groups that are funded and supported probably by Jordan, um, and in the northwest part of Syria, where they are targeting groups that are funded and supported by Turkey. Um, and so if that, the fact that a Russian plane was uh, you know, bombed out of the sky by the Islamic State is not enough to turn the predominance of Russian strikes towards the Islamic State in Syria. I don't think there's anything we can do to make it happen. You want to weigh in on this? So I, I think you know the, where the where the rubber hits the road is that we're working with a number of partners in Europe that are looking at life a little bit differently. And so you know I, I do believe that in terms of not linking. Uh, that we will continue to have side-by-side um, -side steps with, with the Europeans on maintaining sanctions, especially because Chancellor Merkel has, uh, has, has really staked a lot on the implementation of, of Minsk in order to get relief from sanctions. So I think you know, that, that, is, that is one thing that, that it, for when you're sitting in New York, it's a little bit easier to have uh, to have these discussions if you're sitting in, in Germany with refugees flooding and it's a, it's a, it's a different perspective. Okay, uh, I want to bring, a, we're going to expand the NSC at this point <laughs> and uh, open it up to, the, to our members on the floor and then I'll 
we'll come back here uh, for the last few minutes. So uh, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Make your questions or your comments. Please keep it uh, relatively group. Evelyn, <coughs> up front. Uh, Evelyn Leopold, uh, journalist at the United Nations. On Ukraine, uh, what do you think, if negotiations really continue or step up, do you think Russia is thinking of a Moldova solution or a Republika Srpska one? Why don't you, in your answer, make clear the, take 30 seconds to define what that choice might, might suggest for those of us who are not real aficionados. So a Moldova solution, I take it, it has Russian peacekeepers uh, on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, and Republika Srpska is a negotiated settlement that has been agreed to all sides, though not maybe fully implemented by all sides. Yeah. I'm sure I'm the only one in the room who didn't know that. So uh, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 so, uh, I, uh, I think they would love to have a Moldova solution. And our goal is to get to a Ukrainian solution. Uh, which is to say, I think the only acceptable resolution is the one that is in the Minsk Agreement, which is that Ukraine controls the borders with Russia. That is the final step of Minsk. Uh, I think the administration has worked exceedingly hard to get the European Union to agree on the full implementation of Minsk, including the restitution of the border control by Ukraine as the condition for lifting sanctions, and that ought to be the conditions for lifting sanctions. Frankly, I don't think that's likely because I don't think that the Russians will accept a Republika Srpska, uh, uh, if that's the, the, the right analogy, uh, uh, solution, which is some kind of uh, autonomous, independent uh, entity that is part of, uh, of a so fully sovereign, recognized uh, Ukraine. Uh, uh, because Russia's goal is, is to make sure that re Ukraine is destabilized sufficiently that it doesn't turn west. And that is the most important thing uh, that has motivated this policy since February of, uh, of 2014. And can I just add, we have to keep in mind that the reason we've had the level of European unity on sanctions, in spite of the fact that the European economy and some European sectors are being harmed by the lack of, of business with Russia, um, is the fact that uh, Russian-backed actors shot down that Malaysian airplane that had over 100 Dutch citizens on board. And Holland uh, and Netherlands are, are one of the greatest trade partners of Russia. And uh, the Netherlands is not going to give in until Russia takes responsibility for that. Um, and you know uh, that is an, another uh, part, of not directly the sanctions, but another part of the European unhappiness. Yes, sir, in the second row. Joel? Thank you. Uh, Joel Mentor, Barclays. My question is about the state of the Russian and Iranian relationship. So we know there's arms cooperation, but Iran and Russia are potentially energy competitors for supplying to Europe. And then also their interests are aligned, but not necessarily identical in Syria. So what are your thoughts? Uh, you want to take, I'll weigh in at the end, but go ahead. So I, you know, one, one of the interesting things is that during the entire time we had a, uh, a growing confrontation, not military, but political and economic, between the United States, between the West, really, and Russia, the, five, the, the four most important Western powers sat down with Russia and China uh, to negotiate a, a uh, remarkable deal on Iran. Uh, and nothing that happened in the Ukrainian theater, or for that matter, what's happening in the Syrian theater, has so far affected the capacity of uh, those six countries, if you include China, uh, to have that, have that negotiation. I think what the, Uran what, what the Russians would like from Iran is uh, they're a little wary about Iranians. They're a potential competitor, I think, in the way you put it, uh, both with, for influence in the Middle East and, importantly, on the energy market. Uh, but they're trying to co-opt them. Uh, and they're trying to co-opt them in, a, in, the, in the bigger game uh, that is Russia against the United States, Russia against the West. By the way, that confrontation is one way in which Russia demonstrates that it is a great power. Uh, it's by us taking them seriously as a great power that, uh, that, that they, they can go back home and say, we are still, a, we're still an important power because people are paying attention to us. The worst thing you can do to Putin is not to pay attention to him. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's, it's what, uh, what is driving him uh, as, uh, as part of, of his motivation. Can I just follow up on that? Because that's how Kimberly began actually the whole session, which is talking about the Russian sense of resentment or humiliation, I forget what words you used, over the, the history of the last few decades. 
Is there anything, we haven't talked really about process or modalities. We've talked about policy. Is there anything we're not doing in the way of showing Russia respect, playing into Putin's concern for status and standing that we could do that wouldn't really cost us anything but might buy us something? I think we have been doing things more recently that are a very good step that we weren't doing early on in the Ukraine crisis, which is keeping channels of communication open. And so, for example, just about six weeks ago, there was a, a major agreement reached between the Coast Guards of the various countries in the Arctic um, about cooperation on issues that are not security related, but that are you know, search and rescue and, and the kinds of things that Coast Guards do that are, are not uh, directly related to security. Early on, after Ukraine happened, we cut off all military to military contact, except at the very highest level. And a lot of military officers in the United States were unhappy about that. And now that seems to be being restored, and I think that's a very good what thing. What about more, I mean, that's pretty technical. What about, I mean, U.S.-Russian relations are not going to be moved by Coast Guard contacts. They're going to move by contacts between an extremely senior American and Mr. Putin. And the question is whether there's any, any scope for something more along those lines. I don't think that Mr. Obama necessarily has the ability to do it because Mr. Putin has said several times publicly that he thinks that Obama is a weak leader who can't control his own uh, country and therefore is not worth negotiating with. And I know that some people have criticized President Obama for not uh, playing a, a more public role in what is happening with the Ukrainian negotiations. I think they're actually more likely to succeed if Obama stays out, um, because I think that Putin cannot ever be seen as giving in and compromising to Obama. Um, and so I, I'm not sure that over the next year and a half there's much that the United States can do in that regard. Robin. I'll get someone towards the back next. I apologize. Hi, uh, Robin Hessman, documentary filmmaker. I'd like to return to what Kimberly said in the beginning about life potentially past Putin. He's not immortal. And the partners that we have in the country, while he isn't immortal, to many people's surprise, the generation coming up is not as pro-Western as, say, the perestroika generation. And they are much, much more patriotic, having had a lot of great television propaganda and a different kind of education in schools. And the partners who are so Western-oriented, as Heidi mentioned, are leaving in droves. I, I know people who, for 20 years, have stuck it out and are now moving. So what are things that we can do, I guess, in terms of soft power with more limited opportunities, considering NGOs being shut down, foreign agent laws, the internet kill switch perhaps being rehearsed, and other elements? I think the answer is there's not much we can do. Um, the soft power is not going to make much of a difference. Hard power is not going to make things any better. Um, we just have to wait it out. And as I said at the beginning, defend our interests, deter the militaristic side of Russia from doing things that would harm us, uh, including by really building up our NATO defenses much more than they have been. Um, I'm, I'm sure that, that Eva would agree with me that the, even though the Russian military may not be capable of waging a full-scale war against NATO and winning, uh, what they can do is increasingly deny NATO having easy access to coastal areas and to small pits of territory, which would just make it very expensive for NATO in both terms of uh, monetary things, in terms of lives, in terms of keeping the agreement of the alliance going. Uh, there's an outstanding article in the latest issue of Survival Magazine, uh, the London uh, International Institute for Security Studies, uh, uh, Strategic Studies, talking about that. And so we need to do much more on concentrating on defending and deterring, even though we're keeping communication open. Just to, uh, on, on the soft power side, though, I mean, there, what, what I find uh, really tragic is the lack, uh, there's been a, a lack of, of even interest in, in the U.S. to study Russian, to go and stay in, and, you know, go to school there, and the, ex, you know, the exchanges are, 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 you know, getting more sparse. And I think that that, if you're looking forward to a, another generation that, that is listening to, a, you know, a whole different set of information than, than, than we're seeing over here, then that is one of those things. That, that's part of the, the web you really need to you know, make sure stays in place. And I don't see it. I don't see it there. So I would be very encouraging of, uh, of pushing as much as possible uh, educational exchanges, all of, all of the soft power parts that don't touch on any of the, the, sensitive, mm -hmm. um, the sensitive parts of, of, uh, of the presidency in, in Russia right now and inviting Russians to come here so that they get a real view of what the United States is rather than what the textbooks and the media are telling them. 
Okay, someone in the, uh, yes sir, in the back. Uh, thank you, Robert Abel, SC, uh, SC Magazine. Uh, my question is um, more so in the cyberspace. What do you see um, the U.S. doing in the future to help curve uh, both cyber espionage and cyber attacks against U.S. interests from um, both state-sponsored organizations within Russia and criminal organizations that are based in Russia? As a, you know, this is an NSC meeting, right? We need, are they cleared? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it, this, is, this is one of the new battlefields uh, of the future. Uh, and it's a, it's a very complicated battlefield because it is in one sense a state-owned public, it's a, it's a, it has a public interest, but it's a privately owned entity. Uh, this is the fundamental problem we have with cyber. It's very different from the, the normal ways we think about the use of heart military power. That is owned by the state, it is operated by the state, uh, this is not owned and operated by the state, it's operated by private companies. Uh, and, and it is the private companies that have that, uh, have the data, have the capabilities that are running the infrastructure that is being attacked, uh, being stolen from. Um, uh, and uh, as a result, our capacity to put together a counter cyber strategy is extinct, you know, we've been trying to do it now for 14, 15, 16, 17 years. When did you start doing it, uh, Philip? Uh, back in the mid-1990s. Uh, is, is extraordinarily complicated because what you can do uh, is limited by what the, the government possesses. Uh, you need the cooperation of private industry in order to do, when we had cooperation up to certain points, and we have a little less cooperation these days because of Mr. Snowden. Uh, 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 and the revelations that came that came with that. Well, so this is this is a new this is our new battlefield, but this is a strategic battlefield that we will have, irrespective of what is happening in Syria, or in Ukraine, uh, part because of the non-governmental entities that are involved in it, and part of it because this is a new this is a great uh, area of competition between us. Uh, and the Russians and the Chinese and other countries right. that have that capability. Yeah, in no, re in no way is this a limited to a U.S.-Russian problem, uh, coming, exactly. up with, coming up with the rules of the road, shall we say, and that we can continue to do some of the things we want to do and discourage some other things. Is, uh, it's not a bilateral problem. It really is a global uh, foreign policy problem. I want to make sure some people, anybody? Yes, sir, in the back, next to the last row there. I want to be uh, equal geographically here. All uh, right, so Ambassador Valerie, you want to you introduce mentioned? yourself? Uh, Evan Smith, I work for. Thanks, Evan. Hi. <laughs> um, I work for Doug Schoen. Uh, you mentioned earlier that Moldova, you know, a Moldovan solution is what the Russians would desire in Ukraine, even if they can't necessarily, um, uh, you know, get the Republic of Serbska outcome they would, you know, that we would maybe advocate for. Uh, is that something that's sustainable for them? You know, Eastern Ukraine is not Transnistria. It's not going to be 1,400 peacekeepers and a couple million rubles every year. Could they even sustain that outcome over the long term, both economically and politically and militarily? Uh, I'll start, which since you asked me the question, I think the answer is no. And I think we're seeing already in Crimea what the cost is of trying to sustain that annexation, which we seem to uh, have ignored until the electricity started going out uh, as a result. So no, it's not sustainable uh, for them, and it and it'll be the kind of the same kind of drain although perhaps not in, in lives, but economically and politically, the same kind of drain that they had when uh, the last time they deployed their troops outside of their, the borders of, uh, of the then former Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And this is not a wise move for, for Putin, it seems to me, in the long run. Uh, he may be, stay there as a president for a long time, but in the end, he is a declining power, and we're stronger. And as long as we maintain our policy and consistency of our policy, we remember what our goal is, which is to make sure that Putin does not succeed in destabilizing Ukraine and that we succeed in, in having Ukraine emerge as a vibrant uh, Western-oriented uh, society, he's going to lose and we're going to win. The danger with analogies to see, I think, of declining powers, if that, if that trajectory is recognized by the declining power in question, they might have a certain incentive to interrupt that trajectory of history. 
Can, I, can I, I just add something? I'm not sure I agree with Evo because, when, again, when I was there in May, the sense I get is that the Ukrainian population is not really focused on Eastern Ukraine. The Ukrainian American and the Ukrainian Canadian populations are focused on East Ukraine. But the Ukrainian Ukrainian population is much more focused on domestic reforms. They've never felt that Eastern Ukraine, uh, with its um, you know, uh, large, uh, uh, both uh, Russian ethnic population, but also its relationship with Russian industry, has really been part and parcel of the Ukraine that they see as being Ukraine. And so I think that there is a possibility of some kind of negotiated arrangement in the future that might not look exactly like Moldova, but that also wouldn't look like a completely sovereign Ukraine um, on the borders that it had before um, that could be acceptable if you could get somebody in Russia who was uh, not against Ukraine becoming a stable country. Good luck on that. That's, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. the, the, that's oh, a big if. Yeah. I've got, uh, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to come back to you all, eight minutes, to sort of ask you what and the basis of this conversation and your thinking about this you would introduce into u.s foreign policy if anything that is not now uh is not now present when it comes to u.s russian relations what 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 would you what would you want to uh change sure we'll get lucy now i remember at nyu uh we'll have a new president fairly soon uh it sounds like most candidates favor a more robust yeah. posture in syria uh that may change, obviously, once they take office. Uh, but uh, accept that premise for a moment. Um, what do you think that looks like? And can a larger presence be leveraged to achieve a political settlement without trading off Ukraine versus Syria? Uh, what, what's the risk reward of that, of a, of a, of a larger presence, uh, whatever form it might uh, take in Syria? Why don't I take that quickly? Because I don't think the kind of presence that the United States is contemplating would give it that kind of leverage. I think bulk, the bulk of a ground partner can't come from the United States. If there's going to be a serious ground partner in Syria, it's going to have to be local. I don't even think it's going to come from neighboring Arab states. I think it's going to have to be largely Syrian. Uh, you're more likely to get it if the bombing is intensified and if special operations force presence is intensified and people sense that associating themselves with us is a good bet for the future. But I still think the bulk of that is going to have to come uh, locally. And we haven't talked about it today. I think in terms of the government, it's not just going to be trying to persuade the Russians to rethink their relationship. I, as difficult as that is, I actually think it's more difficult to get the Iranians to rethink their relationship with the current Syrian government. So I could actually imagine a time where the Russians might be somewhat tempted and the Iranians would say not so fast. And uh, so I think we've got, we've got two factors that are supporting this government. But I, I think there's a ceiling on what not just the U.S. will do, which is predictive. I think there's a ceiling on what the United States should do, given the nature of the adversary. Because again, it's not simply a question of quote unquote defeating ISIS in the sense that it's an entity that holds territory. You've then got to hold that territory yourself. And that is not something we want to be in the business of doing. I would think that uh, we need a local partner. And at the moment, I don't, I don't see one. And I think the real challenge for our policy is how do you generate the emergence of such a partner? Well, again, I think only up to a certain point, and after a certain point, I think it actually becomes counterproductive. But that's, that's a serious conversation, which is what type of U.S. policy would make it more likely for such a local partner to emerge, and at what point does it discourage it, or does it actually play into the, the narrative that ISIS uh, has? And I think that's, that's one of the basic elements of the debate that, we are, that we're having. Uh, Lucy Commissar? Yeah. Um, want, want to wait for a microphone, please? Oh. Uh, Lucy Commissar, I'm a, a journalist. So in a, in a, a totally unscientific survey in the reception before this event, I asked several people, did they think this meeting was going to be an expression of Cold War 2.0? And two people said yes, and one person said no. So listening to- What, what is your question? No, li so listening to the things of uh, what people said, Heidi talked about- okay, Lucy, Stan no, what is your question? I want to know whether or not uh, what people are saying about what's going on in Russia is a reflection of uh, Cold War 2.0 or something else. And I want you to give an example. No, Heidi actually, no. Talked, actually, let me give no. one example. Heidi talked about standard of living going down, hits to pensions, living standards. That's the United States. You talked about. Lucy, uh, I'm going to cut you off. To Lucy, people from it's the whole time for homeland. questions, not for That's statements. That's the United States. So is what we're talking about Cold War 2.0, where things are being used to attack the Russians, which when you look at them are actually 
problems that the United States also has. Okay, enough. We'd like questions, please. I have an answer on okay, Cold great. War 2.0. There are three things that are fundamentally different right now between the Cold War and the current situation. One is that outside of its nuclear weapons, Russia is no longer a superpower. Okay, the nuclear weapons are still there, but it doesn't have alliances all over the world. It doesn't have this major alliance in Eastern Europe that it used to have that's gone. It's not really an equal power to the United States and certainly not an equivalent economic power. Uh, the second thing is that Russia right now does not have an ideology. And Putin has changed every few months how he looks at the outside world and how he uses a framework to describe it. And nothing seems to have stuck, um, but there's no ideology yet at the moment. Um, and the third thing, as we've already discussed, is that there's no communist this party. There's no institution that is guaranteeing what happens, uh, that there is some kind of a discussion among elites in, a, in some kind of a formal framework about everything from succession that follows Putin uh, to the question of policymaking. And so I think all of those things make it, um, in one sense, less dangerous because there's not the same kind of adversary that there was before, but in another sense, much more dangerous for U.S. interests because the outcome is much less predictable. Eva, I was going to ask you a slightly different version of that, which is you were very tough, as I understood it, on Ukraine, what Russia's doing. But in your reaction to things, what Russia's up to in Syria, I think there your, 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 your arguments, if you will, are more, I don't know if the word's modulated, but there's nothing per se. The United States should not get up every morning and necessarily resist what Russia's doing in Syria. There it depends more on what it's doing, which is qualitatively different than what Russia's up to in Ukraine. Well, in part because what Russia's doing in, in Syria doesn't violate any international norm or even an international law. It's defending a, a government, which we happen to not think should be there, but it was invited by that government to defend uh, uh, whatever is left of it, the territory that it still controls. So in a fundamental order, ordering sense about what was going on, Ukraine and Syria are, diff are different. And I don't know if you want to get to the larger question of uh, what we should do Okay, let's, uh, I mean, uh, we, uh, like, I, let's take one more question before yeah. we get to that. Just, I, can, can I just... Uh, yes, ma'am. Because I think this is... It, it's interesting in, in the question you just, you just asked because it all, all depends on your framework. Um, I think that for those who think that dealing with, with Russia is something that is transactional, um, that it is, you know, that, that we see mm -hmm. common interests in certain places, not common interests in other, but it is a, a, a transactional relationship. Um, then that puts you sort of w with, a, with one kind of framework about how you, how you engage. And then the second is really taking into consideration whether or not uh, you're listening to the fact that part of the, part of the thinking behind this, uh, this government is it's an, it's an anti-U.S. as a unipolar um, leader of the, of the world, and it's specifically anti-U.S. Anti in, it, in its rhetoric. Um, that a sphere of influence and an ability to control both the rule writing and the, and the, the common space outside of Russia is part of the, the ethos of, of what President Putin actually stands for right now. If, you, if that is your starting point, then that, is, then that is front and center, and you can find areas to, to, to act um, together for example, the way that, that Evo was, dis, was describing the engagement in Syria. But Ukraine is fundamentally different. It is part of the sphere of influence. There, there is a world order question around it um, that I think it needs to be front and foremost in, in everyone's thinking. So I, I would look at those two frameworks differently. Yeah, I'm going to change it. I'm sorry, we're actually going to not have one more question. I want to go and make sure people on the panel. OK, so we've had this conversation for 85 minutes. <laughs> so what would we? Uh, what would you introduce into U.S.-Russian relations on the assumption that what is, ha unless you feel comfortable with either where we are, with both where we are and where we're heading, I assume you would want some things to, to change. So what is, it, uh, what is it we would like to introduce? So I'll start with Professor Martin. The thing that we can't change is what the political candidates say about Russia. I wish we could change that, but we can't because we live in a free society. I think that's making the relationship worse. Um, the one thing I would say is that the more we can look for even very small areas of agreement, 
the better that we will be, the more that we are emphasizing. Such as, we what, do, where, where do you see some that are particularly ripe? The Arctic. I think that we, we have some forward motion there, and that's going to be a common problem. Um, I think the environment is a common problem that's going to be affecting everybody. Um, you know, I think that there are, are, are a variety of creative things, looking at space cooperation. You know, there, there are astronauts and cosmonauts circling above us on the Mir station as we speak. Um, I think that there are all kinds of ways that in little ways we can keep communication open and say we respect Russia and treat it as a, a worthy partner in all of these things that are happening and that they have equal status on these, on these various uh, uh, sorts of things while making sure that our defenses are up and keeping things strong and not trusting uh, what happens in the military sphere. So implicit then in what you're saying is, I'd almost say you're, you're, you're arguing for a policy of non-linkage that just because we don't agree on certain things, yes. that should not preclude our ability to cooperate exactly. on other things. Exactly. Such so a decentralized or disaggregated relationship yep. you think we ought to pursue. Yep. Okay, Eva, just wanna understand. So I don't necessarily disagree with that delinkage, de uh, de but I, 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 step back for a second. Uh, we've just gone through a 25, 24 year experiment of trying to integrate Russia into Western institutions. The global economy, uh, the security order, uh, through the UN Security Council and a variety of other things. That's, that was the, the promise of the end of the Cold War. Uh, and, and, and I think it's clear that that didn't succeed. We'll leave it to historians why it didn't succeed, but it hasn't succeeded. And so we need to have a new policy. It's not Cold War 2.0 for all the reasons I think Kimberly laid out. It's just very different. But we are dealing with a, a, a big power. And it seems to me that we need to do a, a, a big power declining and dangerous. Uh, we need to do two things. We need to reestablish deterrence. We need to actually think about deterrence in deterrence terms. Uh, what is noteworthy is that both in Ukraine and in Syria, deterrence wasn't part of our thinking, wasn't part of our policy. We weren't trying to deter Russians from moving in militarily. Uh, the president took military response in Ukraine off the table. I don't think it should necessarily be on the table, but that's not the same thing as taking it off the table. Uh, so we need to think back on, the, on, the, on how we reinstitute deterrence, uh, which we were very good at in the, in, in the 60s, and particularly in the 70s and the 80s, and we're not very good at it too. But secondly, what came with the deterrence was a willingness to have a dialogue at a very high level to make sure that that relationship wouldn't spin out of control. And I also agree with Kimberly that I think the relationship today between the United States and Russia, between the West and Russia, is perhaps more dangerous than any time since the mid-1960s. In the mid-1960s, we started talking to the Russians. And because we were starting to talk to the Russians at a whole variety of different levels, the, the chances of, of an accident were less, although we're now finding some interesting documents about 1983 and the possibility that the Russians were misinterpreting what we were doing there. Just think what the kinds of situations that we are now in where Russian aircraft are flying deliberately through Turkish air airspace, don't say it wasn't deliberate, of course they were, uh, where they are flying without their military transponders on uh, so that civilian aircraft can't see them, where they're buzzing uh, naval vessels. This is all ripe for an accident. And if you don't talk to each other, if you don't have the capacity to find ways in which you can communicate with each other, deterrence becomes a spiraling relationship, potentially, that is extremely dangerous. So what I would reintroduce into the equation is an explicit thinking about deterrence. I'm very pleased that the NATO-Russia Council, the NATO folks decided in the ministerial meeting to restart uh, the NATO-Russia Council discussions on the military side. So you have the kind of conversations that the U.S. is now doing with Russia when it comes to targeting Syria, not, not about the deconflicting of flights in Syria, uh, that you need all over the world because the one thing we don't want is this confrontation leading to an all-out war between us and the Russians? So what Russia showed us over the past several years is that it uses multifaceted levers of power, whether it's gas pricing, whether it's bond markets in the, the three billion bond that was negotiated with uh, with the Yanukovych government prior to its, its fall, which has become a very big issue just resolved literally today in terms of how the IMF was going to look at it. Trade policy, um, sanctions, I mean, the, the whole basket of issues on the economic side that forced a lot of people in the US government that tend to be more siloed 
And since this is an NSC format, I mean, we, 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 do, we, we do tend to silo our different parts of government. And I think what this called for was a, a serious stepping up and engagement of, of the people talking about national security, traditional national security with economic um, and other issues. So thinking, thinking more uh, across platforms of leverage of power. Uh, but I do think we, do, we need to step that up um, significantly. I think that the establishment of an energy security department at the State Department so that we could start thinking about how we can work on energy security issues was, was a very smart idea. Um, and has been very useful. We should continue to not only ramp that up, but also talk to our partners um, in, in other countries about doing something similar, because I think we're in a few countries that actually has, within our foreign policy establishment, a big department focused on energy security. And then the one last thing I would, I would say, and this is again from the perspective of, of the Far East, is that don't forget that Russia is a Pacific power, not in the kinder and gentler way, but that it actually just announced it's going to be um, building up military capacity uh, in the uh, Kuril Islands, uh, much to the chagrin of Japan um, about two days ago. So let's just not forget, because we're all, we all focus on the Atlantic um, and the transatlantic, that we don't forget the Pacific. And then under what circumstances, if any, would you be willing to rethink sanctions policy? Or do you think that it, it, it ought to remain totally based upon what happens in Ukraine? I, I firmly believe that the commitment to not relieve sanctions until Minsk is implemented um, is something that has been a red line not only for Europe but the US, and that to backtrack on that would be sending a very bad signal. Yeah. Um, I do think that there are, are probably other ways to, to figure out how we think about Minsk, but at the end of the day, uh, any, any rollback of sanctions uh, that is not that is that does not check uh, at least you know a good chunk of the boxes there and the last two are, are pretty substantial meaning the pullback of, of heavy armaments and the turning over of the border I think if you don't see something akin to that happening then then it's going to be um, it, it's going to it's going to show that we're we're not able to, to stand by our commitments I think just for clarity's sake Evo for 30 seconds when you talk about reestablishing deterrence what would it take to do? Are you talking about like more U.S. forces in NATO? Are you, what is it you're... So it's, I mean, the, it's actually a mindset. It is how you think about the use of military, the, the deployment of military forces, how you talk about military force, about what, being clear about where your goals are so that if, they, if, if there's, uh, to clearly communicate, don't cross this line, and then when you do cross the line, make sure that there is something to do against it. Uh, it. It is actually less. I actually am perfectly happy, more or less, with what NATO has done in response. I think there's a very bright red line that the Russians understand uh, that divides NATO territory from non-NATO territory. We now have a NATO flag in every single East European country in a command and control. And we have US troops in every single country in Eastern Europe, which we didn't have before uh, Ukraine. And frankly, uh, we were able to defend East Berlin with very little troops because of deterrence. We are able to defend the Baltics because of deterrence. It's understanding that it is about deterrence rather than uh, the, uh, the uh, rather than uh, the particular capability you need to have there. It's about the communication capability. We kind of lost that because we thought we were in an integrating uh, policy where we were trying to get the Russians to be part of our Western institutions. We didn't talk in those ways. We need to relearn how to do that. So on that positive note, let me uh, thank our three panelists and thank you all for uh, attending the session. You.